Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for continuing to follow the Artemis One mission. Uh, if you recall, uh, two days ago we had a, uh, a scrub following the uh, August 29th launch attempt, and uh, we we uh, needed a little bit of time to assess our risk posture headed into a subsequent launch attempt, and uh, we reviewed that today as a mission management team. A little bit of time uh, helped us work through all of the information that we gathered from from the uh, the uh, first launch attempt. And uh, we worked through a, uh, a number of issues, and we discussed our uh, risk acceptance rationale for a subsequent launch attempt. If you require from our prior attempt, uh, we had the uh, tail service mast umbilical leak. We had a hydrogen leak in the tail service mast umbilical. Uh, that uh, coming out of the last uh, uh, launch attempt, uh, we met and uh, agreed to do some work out at the launch pad. That, that work has been completed. We had an issue with the core stage uh, inner tank uh, vent valve. Um, that has checked out, and, and we do not consider that to be an issue. We also had a, uh, an issue uh, confirming that we were able to thermally condition all of the core stage engines within the required uh, temperature limits as part of what we call the engine bleed. And, uh, and we worked through that uh, today. And then uh, near the end of the launch attempt, we saw some uh, cracks in the foam on the thermal protection system on the core stage at the inner tank flange, and we, and we reviewed that, um, that issue today. There was uh, some incremental risk acceptance. Uh, as, as the mission management team, uh, it is our role to uh, review risk acceptance and then the uh, flight readiness rationale. And then uh, have, we also have uh, requirements change authority following the agency flight readiness review, and we review, we review any changes from the uh, previously accepted uh, risk baseline that we had at the agency FRR. And we, and we did that today. Uh, only two of those items required some incremental risk acceptance, and that was the, uh, the thermal conditioning of the engines associated with the engine bleed, and then the uh, core stage uh, thermal protection system, the crack that we saw, specifically what is termed crack number two at the inner tank flange uh, just due to the potential for debris transport um, and then uh, contact with a booster set motor. Uh, it's a low likelihood uh, uh, occurrence, but it is something that we considered um, an acceptable risk. So we reviewed our risk acceptance uh, rationale and our overall risk posture, and uh, we are setting up for a launch attempt on September the 3rd, Saturday, and we have, um, we're comfortable with our flight uh, uh, rationale and risk acceptance there. Uh, in, in addition to that, we did have some late analysis come in associated with an off-nominal uh, performance uh, scenario where uh, if we have, um, and this we're not planning on this, but should we have a underspeed at the uh, completion of the translunar injection maneuver, uh, it shows that our trajectory would put us into what we call an eclipse violation, which is a power production issue for the Orion spacecraft. So. As a result of that, it, it is specific to the, um, the September 4th launch opportunity. Uh, we agreed to take that off the plate. Uh, so we are, uh, again, proceeding into our Saturday launch attempt. Uh, we're comfortable with our risk posture. Uh, that said, there's no guarantee that we're going to get off on Saturday, but we're going to try. Uh, and, and the uh, technical teams uh, have put in a tremendous amount of work in a very short amount of time to get us here. And um, it, again, uh, thanks to, to the work and the effort that they've put in. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it back to you, Rachel. Okay. John Honeycutt. Uh, good afternoon. Um, it, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think when I talked the uh, day before yesterday, um, I mentioned that we had a lot of uh, data to go look at. And so, we, you know, we had come out of the... The first launch attempt, we were unsuccessful on gathering the data that we wanted to gather for that what we call the bleed kickstart. Um, the team has done a tremendous amount of work uh, starting uh, right after the launch, even up in, until uh, this morning and to the noon hour, leading us into the to the MMT meeting. Uh, what I would tell you is they've uh, they just did an outstanding job nailing it flat and. We'll share some more of those technical details, but you know, at a, at a high level, uh, we have convinced ourselves, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, that we have good quality liquid hydrogen 
um, going through the engines, and there's there's no fuzz on that. Um, we've also, um, through the course of uh, analyzing the data, um, looked at uh, five additional measurements that we can look at um, to assure ourselves that we are getting that that quality data. Um, and that's on the engine that that's on the engine side. And then on the core stage side, um, we were able to go back and verify that the core stage uh, is providing the amount of hydrogen and the quality of hydrogen to all four engines. And so uh, I'll turn it. I, I say, Dr. Blevins and his technical team just did an outstanding job. Uh, working through that, and we'll share some some of those details. I'm sure as we get to the questions. Okay, John Blevins. Yeah, I'll just add that uh, we do have an outstanding team, and they did look at the data. You know, we had some things we were looking for in launch attempt one that were combined with what we expected to do in a wet dress, and uh, and so we had some sensors that didn't tell us what we thought we would do, and we did the right thing by standing down with that uncertainty on Monday. But we have. Uh, confirm that we did have good flow through those engines. We know we can chill those engines. Uh, we're ready to proceed that way to launch. Uh, you know, the SLS team does a lot of other things, and as Mike mentioned, we brought some other things. We in inspect the vehicle. We brought the uh, the concerns we had over any TPS, uh, as minimal as they are forward, and uh, we've analyzed, and the teams are uh, ready to support uh, launch attempts on uh, Saturday. Okay, thank you. Charlie? Well, good evening, everyone. Um, it's great to be back here talking to you about our preparations for Launch Countdown. Um, I think we met and talked just a couple days ago, and uh, when, we, when we had our last press conference on Tuesday, we had finished up our safing and securing out at the pad, and we were getting ready to send the access stand out so that we could uh, begin work on the LH2 TSMU. A purge can where we detected that leak uh, during our tanking operations. Uh, that work is all behind us. We finished up uh, the work. We were able to uh, find what we believe is the source of the leak and correct that. And uh, that purge can's been put back together. We have leak tested it at ambient conditions and also done some flow through tests with uh, our HazGas system. And we believe we're in a good configuration uh, for the next loading attempt. We also went back based on what we saw during the, uh, and working with John's team, uh, looking at the any countdown enhancements that we need, might need to make. We have made a couple of, of changes as we prepare for this next loading operation. And really what that means is that we're going to start our LH2 chill down, the facility side of the chill down, um, right around the same time that we begin our locks uh, chill down. So uh, that'll allow us to begin that kickstart bleed a little bit earlier. And, uh, and we'll pick up that kickstart because I know I'll probably get a question about when that is. And, uh, and we'll start that just about 8 o'clock on Saturday morning. So we've made a couple of changes to the countdown. Uh, our teams have been very busy uh, in firing room three, uh, running against the model. We finished up two days of, uh, of that testing to make sure that we had our procedures all down and ready to go. It didn't require any software changes. It was just the procedures that we go through, but we also want to make sure that we have those um, ready to go. And. Um, Everything right now is on track. We have remained in launch countdown. I know some folks think that, you know, launch countdown, it starts two days prior. Sometimes when we're in a scrub, we, uh, we stay in launch countdown, our, and that's what we have done this particular time. We've been in originally in a 96-hour scrub. Of course, we added a day on to go do this, uh, this purge can work. And we've also taken replenishment of uh, both LOX and hydrogen. Both tanks are topped off, which is great. And, uh, and so we are on track to support our, uh, our o 0557 tanking operations on Saturday morning, setting us up, as Mike said, for that 217 uh, window open. Okay, thank you. And Melody. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, you got to me a little faster than I thought. <laughs> Anyway, as I was walking over here, I noticed a lot of anvils kind of streaming in from the West Coast, and I even saw some mammatus clouds out there. So let's go ahead and look at satellite and see what's going on. 
So basically, right now, we actually do have offshore flow, meaning flow out of the west coast, or generally a westerly flow. And you can see a lot of thunderstorms popping up across the interior portion of the state at this point in time. They are spreading east, but I actually just looked at radar. Uh, you're looking at infrared satellite here. Um, radar is different. Uh, but in general, uh, the showers themselves are staying across the interior portion, not not getting close to the Cape at this point in time, but you can see a lot of anvil from a lot of those showers and thunderstorms. But anyway, uh, this pattern that we have today is actually going to be transitioning into more of an onshore flow regime as we get into tomorrow, and that is mainly due to the fact that we'll have a ridge that's building across the state of Florida. And uh, what it will do is deliver easterly flow, and that easterly flow will stay intact for several days. Uh, so that's actually normally pretty good news for us. It keeps our lightning risk a little bit lower than what we would normally see on a typical afternoon in the summer for Florida. So anyway, we'll move on to the primary launch window forecast. And with that, you can see I have a 60% go uh, for the launch window when it opens up in the early afternoon on Saturday. Uh, winds pretty uh, steady out of the east at 8 to 12 knots, which uh, if you want to convert to miles per hour, that is 9 to 13 miles per hour. I know there's some weather nerds out there that might pick up on that. But anyway, um, temperature pretty warm, as you can expect. It is Florida, 86 degrees. Our main concerns for the primary launch window will be the cumulus cloud roll and the surface electric field roll. So then we'll go ahead and skip ahead to the backup window, is, which is actually Monday. And uh, that actually improves. The weather improves a little bit to 70%. Uh, and that's mainly due to the fact that the launch window is a little bit later into the afternoon time frames. And with that, we would expect the East Coast sea breeze to be positioned farther across the interior portion of the state, giving us a lot of sinking air behind it in general. So uh, basically, the weather looks good. I wouldn't be shocked if, if uh, there are periods where we are technically red for weather, um, but the bottom line is that I don't expect weather to be a showstopper for either launch window.